my that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that a bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I have done, but because of who you are. I am flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. Wave and toss to the ocean, vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling. That the eyes that see my sin Would look on me with love And watch me rise again, watch me rise again. Who am I? Who am I? The, the voice that come to see Would call out through the rain And come the storm in me Not because of who I am but because of what you've done Not because of what I've done But because of who you are I am flower quickly fading Here today and gone tomorrow A wave locked in the ocean A vapor in the wind Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord, you catch me when I'm falling And you've told me who I am I am yours Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, vapor in the Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord, you catch me when I'm falling And you've told me who I am I am, I am yours I am yours I am yours Let's just bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, indeed the question that we need to look into is who I am. 
but and the answers that we're looking for is because of who you are. Father in heaven, may it be that we bring honor and glory to your name as we study your word at this moment. May we be able to be inspired and be awed by your presence. Forgive me, Lord, from the sins that I have committed, that I may not block your message that you intended for your people today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The song you have heard is entitled, Who I Am. Let me just share with you the lyrics of the song, just to remind us again of what they, they've sung. Who I am, that the Lord of the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I, that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear when I'm calling, you catch me when I'm falling. And you tell me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Now, this morning, as I was hearing Elder Errol, he mentioned to you, he mentioned the phrase, who I am. And then Sister Simbongali, when her prayer is, I, and I, again, I heard, she, she mentioned about the same um, statement or same phrase, who I am. And and now we're looking at it, who I am. I don't know if this just coincidence or really God planned it to be. To inspire us today of, of thinking really who I am in God's presence and in God's power. Plainfully and powerfully, the message of that song conveyed that no matter how small or insignificant you and I may feel, that the Lord of all the earth not only knows our name, but he has made us special and he calls us his own. You see, David, the great songwriter and a friend close to God's heart, wrote a similar hymn with the same message that is found in the book of Psalm chapter 8. In considering the majesty and greatness of God, David felt insignificant by comparison and he stands in awe in the majesty of the Lord. David realized just how vast and magnificent God truly is. He's even more amazed that God would take time to notice him, a mere mortal man. Now let's look at Psalm 8. But you see, rather than simply reading the scripture, let me invite you to watch and listen to this video clip as it provides us of a wonderful job of visualizing this inspired him. A Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Who have set your glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. A reader noted that the psalm is an unsurpassed example of what a hymn should be. Celebrating the glory and grace of God, rehearsing who he is and what he has done, and relating us 
and our world to him in a spirit mingled with joy and awe. In the beautiful expression of praise to God, David stands amazed that God, the God of creation, the great and glorious Yahweh, would pay attention to the frail people of the earth. God focused his attention and lavished his love on us is a living proof of our dignity as creatures made in the image of God. We discover our true value and worth only when we make God the reference point of our lives. I would repeat it. We discover our true value and worth only when God, when we make God the reference point of our lives. In other words, we matter because we matter to God. Apart from knowing God, we have no understanding of who we are really or what role we're supposed to play in this great universe. But through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, David reveals three wonderful truths that declare both the intrinsic value of humanity and the awesome majesty of God. <clears throat> the first truth is that you and I are created by God. All of us know who Sir Isaac Newton is. He's a famous mathematician and a scientist who strongly believed in God. However, he had a very close friend who did not believe in God. So Sir Isaac devised a plan to try to convince his friend that God did exist and he had created the universe. One day he went to a carpentry shop and asked the owner to make a model of our solar system. This model was to be made to scale, intricately painted and designed to resemble as closely as possible to the actual solar system. After several weeks, Isaac picked up the model, paid for it, and placed it in the center of a table in his house. Sometime later, his atheistic friend came over for a visit. When the friend arrived at Dr. Newton's house, the model of the solar system caught his eye, and he asked Sir Isaac if he could inspect the model more closely. The atheist inspected the model. He was impressed by the fine craftsmanship and the beauty of the, of the pieces. After a while, the atheistic friend asked Isaac who had crafted this wonderful model. Sir Isaac promptly replied that no one had made that model. It just appeared on his table by accident. Confused, the friend repeated the question, and yet, Newton stubbornly clung to his answer that the model had just appeared out of the thin air. Finally, the friend became upset and Isaac explained the purpose of his answer. If he could not convince his friend that this crude replica of the solar system had just happened by accident, how could the friend believe that the real solar system with all its complexity and design just appeared by chance and time. The point is design always demands a designer. Creation always requires a creator. The Bible says the heavens are telling the glory of God. They are marvelous display of his craftsmanship. Psalm 119 verse one. The fingerprints of God are clearly everywhere. David specifically mentions, for example, the moon and the stars. The moon may seem to be only a lifeless dust ball in the sky, but it serves some very important functions. Now, Errol and I know about this. The moon provides us with light at night. Now, I go fishing, and on last Saturday night, there was full moon. And I appreciated the poem. Actually, Emma show, um, asked me to take some pictures and she posted it on Facebook. Those who have um, Emma as their friend could probably see the, those photos that I have taken. It's a full moon and it, the, the, the light reflects on the waters as well. 
And you could just marvel at how wonderful God had uh, created. So the light, that light provides light for the night. As the Bible says, God made two greater lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made the stars. That's in Genesis 1.16. But you see, the moon also causes our oceans to rise and fall. And this is where um, error really would um, uh, probably um, understand this. Because when we go fishing, we always look for high tides rather than low tides. And this is where it is. The moon causes the oceans to rise and fall, causing the high tide and the low tide. Its gravitational pull on the earth is just a right to cause the oceans to circulate. This movement helps the seas to clean themselves and absorb oxygen. The tides are needed for the oceans to support life. The work of God's finger is evidenced by our perfect moon. If it were too big, it would cause dangerous tidal waves and earthquakes. If it were too small, the oceans would become stagnant and unable to support life. Concerning the stars, Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote that we seem to take them for granted. If constellations were visible only once in a century, everyone on earth would stay up all night to gaze at, at them. The heavens really are telling the glory of God. But God is not only the creator of the universe, but he is also the creator of you and me. Verse 5 reads, For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. My brothers and sisters, you and I are God's marvelous creation. That the God of the universe bothered to create us. It just proves just how important we are and how valuable we become when we live our life for him. You and I are not an accident. You and I are not the fluke of nature or a byproduct of irresponsible parents. We were handmade by God himself. God prescribed every single detail of our body. He deliberately chose our race, the color of our skin, our hair, and every feature. He custom made you and me the way he wanted. We are wonderfully made. Praise God for that. And you see, God made his hands dirty to create a perfect man. You see, our value and God's majesty don't stop at creation. God tells us that we are cared for by God. In the book, Purpose Driven Life, Pastor Rick Warren writes, Why did? Why did he bother to go all the trouble of creating the universe for us? Because he is a God of love. This kind of love is difficult to fathom, but it's fundamentally reliable. We were created as a special object of God's love. God made you and me so that he could love us. This is a truth to build our life on. That's page 24 of that book. The Bible says, I have carried you since you were born. I have taken care of you from your birth. Even when you're old, I will be the same. Even when your hair has turned gray, I will take care of you. I made you and I will take care of you. I will carry you and save you. Isaiah 46, 3 and 4. God is constantly demonstrating his love for us. The Bible says that God can open the windows of heaven and pour out a great blessing that there is not room enough to receive it. Malachi 
just as he once gave fishermen enough fish to sink their boat. So he can give us more blessings than we have capacity to enjoy it. The, Al the Almighty can bless you with blessings of heaven and above and of the earth beneath. Blessings of the grain and flower. Blessings reaching to the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills. Genesis 49, 25 to 26. When in general, the cor course of life, God's children enter upon new paths. God's love and care goes before them. That is, he anticipates the blessing we require and puts them in our paths. He knows what things we need of before we ask of him. As expectant parents enjoy fixing up the baby's room during the 40 weeks it takes a child to arrive, we know that when the baby will need diapers, so we get some. We know the baby will need to eat, so we buy formula and baby food. We know the baby will sleep a lot, so we put together a complex cream. God goes before us like that. Before we came into this world, he made it inhabitable. Before we needed salvation, he made it possible. Before we needed instruction and guidance, he wrote the Bible. Before we walked through the valley of the shadow of death, he offers eternal life. Before we enter into eternity, he opened the gate to heaven. God's loving care for humankind was ultimately demonstrated by Jesus when he went to the cross. When the mob came to him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he could have called 12 legions of angels to protect him, but he didn't. He had the power to run away from the interrogations of the Jewish council, Pilate and Herod, but Jesus chose not to do so. Instead, he chose to endure ridicule, physical and mental torture. He chose the nails. As our minds, I catch a glimpse of Calvary, we see the great cost at which our salvation came. We see the vast love of God's manifested on an old rugged cross. As insignificant as humanity may seem in relation to the whole created universe, it was still for humankind that Jesus went to the cross. Jesus didn't die to save the rainforest. He didn't die to save the humpback whale. He didn't die to protect the spotted owl. The God of the universe has but one son, and that son died to save you and me. If that does not tell how much we are worth to God, then nothing ever will. Yet, there is still one more marvelous truth revealed concerning God's majesty and man's dignity. Finally, David tells us we are crowned by God. This part of David's psalm is unique and interesting because it has a dual meaning to it. On one level, David is referring all the way back to Genesis when God crowned Adam and Eve and by extension, all humanity, placing them over all creation. And that's found in Genesis 1.26. When God says, let us make man or let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature so that they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. You see, God gave human beings a level of power and authority that he chose not to give to anything else in all creation. He has given us authority and responsibility for the world we live in, our environment and all of the creatures, large and small, with which we share our world. A famous line in the movie Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. 
as Christians, we have a responsibility to take care of the earth and everything in it. To go green, as they say. But beyond that, this verse also speaks of our intrinsic worth as human beings. Of all creation, from the microscopic amoebas to the megaton dinosaurs, only human beings were created in God's image. While all creation declares God's glory, only humanity can reflect God's glory. Poet Walt Whitman once wrote, I think that I would like to live with animals because they are so tranquil. Of course, all creations do not write beautiful poetry like Whitman did, and they never will. Only people are capable of painting a portrait or composing a masterpiece because only people are made in God's image. On a whole other level though, this psalm is messianic in nature. That is, David is not only speaking about God's authority over creation in general, but specifically about the Son of Man's authority over all the earth. The author of Hebrews tells us that even though God gave us dominion and authority over the earth because of the fall, we don't see people being responsible and actually ruling over the earth as God intended. As what we do see is Jesus, who was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Hebrews 9, uh, 2, 9. This book, not only, or this psalm, not only looks backward toward creation, but forward toward the coming of Christ. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, and Jesus had been crowned with the glory and honor, and Jesus has everything under his control. And it is Jesus that we truly discover who we are and what we're worth. In Christ, we recover majesty. In him, we become the people that God wants us to be. So in conclusion, as David sat back with his quill in one hand and parchment in the other, to reflect on God's glory and majesty, he struggled with many deep questions that we still face today. Who I am? What is man that you think thought or that you thought of him? Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? Whenever we feel worthless, the words of this psalm should encourage us. We all and other human beings are valuable because God himself created us in his own glorious image cares for us with unrelenting love and crowns us with honor and glory. My invitation to you is, if you feel small or insignificant, remember that you matter to God. The Lord of all the earth knows your name and feels your hurt. The bright and morning star wants to light the way for your ever wandering heart. He hears you when you call and he catches you when you fall. He alone can tell you who you are. This is my prayer. Amen.